my presentation uh, to introduce the G Streamer. Uh, he's from Canada. Let's welcome him. So, uh, hello. Uh, my my name is Olivier. I work for Collabora since uh, 2007. I've been called GNOME since 2003. 2000, 2000, sorry, and Gentoo since 2003, so a very long time. Since I work at Collabora, I've been working on GStreamer and on Firestream, which is a video calling framework based on GStreamer. So just a short, uh, this is what I've been doing. So a short intro to GStreamer. Out of curiosity, how many of you here know what GStreamer is? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, apart from the two, does anyone else know about GStreamer? Have you ever used GStreamer? You do? Mm -hmm. All right. Have you done any programming with GStreamer? Apart from yeah, you two. Yeah. Huh? I think it's uh, uh, audio and video in uh, audio and radio in and of the, the stream media. Yes, exactly. So it's audio and video streaming. That's what GStreamer is about. Uh, it is used in a lot of different use cases. For example, playback, servers, stuff that's in between, media creation like uh, uh, edit editing, and th things like that, but also for communication, video calls, uh, for video walls, or uh, applications of different kinds. It is very generic. Security cameras, lots of security cameras these days, baby cameras. Uh, a lot of embedded products that we use GStreamer have. We don't know about it. So the way GStreamer works is that uh, it has um, the, it's plugin based. So each functionality, each is in a separate plugin, and then we have a core framework layer that's used to create these plugins and these elements, and uh, then applications access the plugins, access the different functionality through the core framework. Uh, the core framework does not know about audio or video. It only knows about data that flows through a pipeline. It contains base test passes. It contains a bus that allows you get messages from the plugins. It uh, contains things to do negotiation of media types. So if you have two plugins that can do different media types, we have a system where they can negotiate one that's common to them. Uh, and we have language bindings, JavaScript, Python, C++, uh, Vala, C Sharp. Uh, we have a pretty wide uh, language support. And obviously C, our core language. And we have a lot of, of elements for almost everything. Network protocols, uh, different kinds of hardware, also Pure for Linux, uh, Android ha hardware camera, uh, iOS camera, Windows camera access, Windows audio, iOS audio, etc. We have almost every platform covered. And uh, we have different kind of things. We can just on the screen, we can send it to a hardware card, we can do almost everything. So the way GStreamer works is that it's based on elements. So elements are things that have inputs and outputs. Uh, and the things that, the places where elements input things are called sinks, and when they output, it's called a source. So we have, uh, and then we connect sources to sinks, and then so that the output of one element will become the input of the next element. So a very simple pipeline, and so yes, when we connect all these elements together, we create what, what we call a pipeline, which is something that has generates some data, processes it, and then uh, consumes it in the end. So this is a very, very simple pipeline to play back an MP3 file. So first we have file source, which reads from a file on disk. Then we have MAD, which is an MP3 decoder. And then we have also sync, which is a uh, uh, audio Linux sync. It plays back the audio. And when we create a pipeline, we put them in, in another element called a bin. A bin is just an element that contains other elements. A 
And so this is basically a, basically a more simple pipeline where we have all the, the, the common things. But we can make more complex pipelines. Um, for example, we have something called decode bin. And you give it some media, and it will guess the media type. It will figure out which elements need to be connected to play it back. For example, if we give it an out WordPress file with TRN provided, it will plug in the, it will discover, oh, this is AUG. It will plug in an AUG demoxer, which will then realize, oh, there's audio and there's video in it. There's the Vorbis and there's Tiora. Then it will find the Tiora and the Vorbis decoders on the system. It will plug them in, and then it will give you decoded the output. And then we can plug different syncs to that, like also sync, XB image sync, for example, for audio and video. So uh, the cure, the last big revision of the streamer was Jure 1.0. It was released in 2012. It's an API break from the 0.10 version that was stable, the stable release for the previous eight years, I believe. Uh, it's now end of life because we're at 1.2 now. But the core feature, the big changes that we made in, in 1.0 was first, uh, we improved the hardware memory formats, especially for people in embedded. Uh, it's very important that sometimes you have speci specific requirements for the memory used by uh, hardware decoders, hardware encoders, hardware transform elements. You need certain alignment requirements. You might need that, uh, for example, in an image, part of the buffers are on one memory bank and other parts are on another memory bank. Like in a YUV format, you might need Y on, on one memory bank and UV on the other so that there's enough bandwidth to rebuild. So different hardware have different requirements. And now there's a way in GStreamer to express these uh, memory requirements. We have allocators like at memory. When we have buffer pools, we can reuse the, the buffers. Previously, when the, the source would allocate the buffer and then it would travel to the sink and then it would be released. Now, when it comes to the sink, we can release it and send it back to the source so we don't have to incur memory allocations. Uh, and memory allocations can kill your real-time performance. We have another big change that we have real-time processing. So now you can attach metadata to the buffers as they traverse the pipeline. But what traverses pipelines are buffers, and buffers are small mini objects that contain data. And uh, so the, what we can now do is like, for example, uh, if you use an NVIDIA uh, card on your computer to do decoding, it can do the, uh, I think the, uh, the composite, the final composition of subtitles over the image in hardware at display time. So that what we now do is that when the um, we want to add a, a, a subtitle, instead of writing it onto the image, we just attach a subtitle object to the, the image object. Then when they arrive at the sync, then they can all be composed. This is what the data processing is. Also, we've changed the way that the data flows, the metadata flows through the pipeline by attaching events to the paths. So the pads are the the source and the sync pads here. Like, does that work? No. Yes. So the pads are th these things. And then we can attach a metadata there so that it can be retrieved later, making it much easier to do dynamic pipelines. So these were the big 1.0 features. Uh, we broke every plugin out there. We have changed a lot of things. So it, it, it took quite a while to stabilize. And then we reach 1.2. 1.2 is really 1.0, but with all all the features in, um, and all of the plugins were have been ported, so it's a much better release generally. A lot of bugs were fixed that were uh, the gross of 1.0. Uh, the big feature side in 1.2, we added support for the various HTTP streaming protocols, Apple's HLS the standard MPEG dash Microsoft smooth streaming, which is normally used through the .NET. So these are all protocols to uh, stream files over HTTP, and now we support them all. Uh, one of the big features that has been coming in for years is to have GPU-based decoding just work. So if you're like on recent Fedora, for example, you install the Intel GPU decoder packages, 
and then you play it back a video in, in the video application in GNOME, and it's hardware decoding. You don't, you don't notice it, it just, just works. That's, it took us many years to get there. Uh, in Dishro one point also, we had the experimental uh, support for the MFC decoder in the Samsung chips. That was another big one because they are more and more present, these uh, Exynos chips. And we also have official support for iOS and Android. We had them in an official, in official just from SDK before, but now they've been merged. And we've also merged from the GStreamer SDK into a core GStreamer. Uh, the fact that we build binary builds at every release that we distribute for all the platforms that are not Linux, so iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac. The developers on these platforms often just like to install something. They don't, they don't want to build their own libraries often. So we, uh, we offer a, uh, an installer package on Windows and Mac. On, on Mac, there's a framework and all, all the stuff that Mac people like. On Windows, there's an installer, and there are um, Microsoft installer modules that you can merge into your own installer, etc. So this is the current stable. The next release is GStreamer 1.4. The current uh, unstable release is 1.3. Um, the big change, there are many big changes coming there. Some of these less big changes, we've improved GStreamer OpenMax because some platforms like Broadcom's uh, Raspberry Pi platform, they, the hardware API is OpenMax basically. The, Hardware really is a different chip that has its own operating system and runs its own software, and it talks to an API that's basically OpenMax. So the only way that we can talk to it is to speak OpenMax. So we've been doing a lot of uh, improvements to adjust to OpenMax for uh, for that. And right now it basically just works for most cases. And since it's a, a platform with a very very slow CPU, we have to use the other specialized core very much. The HTTP streaming that we introduced in 1.2 has been significantly improved in 1.4. Uh, now all the plugins work in the, we took the best features from each of the three dash Microsoft and HLS plugin, and we applied the, the things that we learned in each of them to all the three. So now they should have uh, really good uh, support, and it should work as well as other kinds of streaming. We've also added, uh, this was contributed by Intel, support for H H.265. Uh, so there's a, a parser, so you can use it with a future hardware decoder from Intel or someone else. And we also integrated the decoder from libav. So we, we can now play back H.265. So these are big things. Another thing that I think is really, really important is uh, that we now support memory to memory devices Currently, uh, mo almost every hardware vendor, my arm hardware vendor, has a uh, different kernel API to talk to the decoder. And this basically means that each one has a pretty terrible API, and they're very tailored to one use case. And there's been an effort now to have at the kernel level a standardized API for that. And the one that's been chosen is video for Linux. First it was pushed by Samsung, but now others are, jo are joining in. Uh, so not having a proprietary kernel a API means that the, open, the uh, user space code can be open source, it can be shared between the different vendors, and it can be therefore much higher quality than if it was single vendor code. Because it'll be more users, more use cases, etc. Uh, th there's different blocks that you can do encoders, decoders, but also converters. There's all kinds of uh, things that can change the color space, that can do scaling, things like that. Right now we have the decoder and the transform element, that's a color space converter, but someone is already working on the encoder, and we're probably gonna get scaling too soon, so. Uh, the, the platform that we developed on originally is Exynos from Samsung, but we have also have people from ST Ericsson I think it's called ST, something else now, I mean, ST. The French company, they're also working on it, on using that API, and they have the streamer. And there is a company called Pain Neutronics 
that's doing the same to uh, get decent uh, drivers for the Freescale platform. Uh, another thing is that we use DMA buff if, if possible. So that means that it's easy to share buffers between the hardware decoder and other parts of the platform that also use DMA buff. For example, the screen controller of uh, OpenGL. So we, we can relatively easily move buffers between different parts of the platform, like they did on Android by having a single allocator and everything. And, and this is really the emerging standard, so if anyone works for a hardware vendor, please, please, please don't do your own thing. Use the standard one. As a, you will have in a couple years to rewrite it anyway, because that's what everyone else will expect. Uh, the other, other thing we, we've improved is uh, RTP. So RTP is an ever-going story. It's, it's a complex world. It has a lot of different things. In this release, we, we've added the MyKey, which is multimedia something key. Uh, and it's a protocol to negotiate encryption keys over an unencrypted uh, medium. So it's to negotiate your original session key. And it's mainly used for RTSP, which is a server, client server streaming protocol. And we now have it both in the GStreamer RTSP server and the GStreamer RTSP client, which is uh, just a sort that you put in your pipeline. While the server is not then, uh, it's a library difference. That's very easy to integrate into applications. So both of these now can negotiate encryption keys using our my key. And in parallel to that, we also had a different effort to support what we call the auxiliary streams in RTP. So traditionally, RTP is just UDP, you send packets one by one, and you hope that they arrive at some point. So that works most of the time, but sometimes the packet is lost. And you have to recover some, somehow from, from that. There's different ways to do that. One of them is to use retransmissions. So if you have enough time at the risk receiver, you can ask the sender, can you resend me this specific packet? So now we have an element that implements the RFC to do that. There's also been someone working just this week on forward error correction. So this is a multi for use case where you lose a lot of packets. For example, a satellite link or another wireless link where you will lose systematically 5% of the packets, but not in bursts. You just regularly have noise on your line and you have a lot of losses. And so then it might make sense to, instead of having a retransmission, to just send extra information with your stream to be able to reconstruct these lost packets at what's forward error correction. is also, actually, in this case, for IP system, it's not really forward error correction, it's forward erasure correction because the whole packet gets lost, it's not broken. So these two uh, things, we cannot integrate in our RTP stack because we have all of the features there to support uh, multiple, multiple streams that are bound together. And we've I've improved the secure RTP support. So we have uh, now uh, more users for it. We use it for RTSP. We have people use it for video calls. We have people use it for quite a few other things. So all the little bugs are our like. So now we can uh, support the different kinds of uh, security be quite well. And hopefully in the near future we'll have it. And you know that's uh, the other big big change that's coming to 1.4 is that uh, there's no GST plugins GL anymore. The GL Open just support has its own little plugin space that the core developers never looked at and kind of lived in its own world. And it was not well, main, well maintained, it did not have regular releases. So now we've merged that back all into the core. Uh, there's been a lot of activity to uh, support OpenGL better. One of the things that, that we've done that we've, we've removed, we had the two OpenGL syncs. We have EGL video sync and GL image sync. So we removed EGL image sync, and everything now should use GL image sync. And uh, this is especially important on platforms such as iOS, Android, 
because this is the only way to get uh, buffers to the screen in an accelerated way. So these are, this is the preferred way to get buffers on the screen on Android, iOS, and OS X. And, but we also support all the other platforms, whether it's OpenGL, which, whether it's uh, Windows, Standard X11 with GLX, Wayland, this Manix, which is the Raspberry Pi API from Broadcom, or any other platform that has more or less standard EGL, that, that should work. We, um, we also have a new library to support that. That's called libgstgl, that replaces libgstegl, and that should have a much nicer API. So it should be relatively easy to uh, have a, a pipeline where the output is a texture and then composite it somehow into your UI. And uh, on the desktop, we still don't use that. We use clutter sync mostly. But hopefully, our goal is to uh, uh, maybe, if we can, just have even clutter using applications use the GL sync, standard GL sync, instead of having some other thing that has the same functionality as duplicated, but just slightly different. So that is. Uh, I think very big moment for it. Another thing that's very big for the desktop mostly. This is less important for embedded, but it's a lot, a lot, a lot of de desktop things have USB ports, so you can just add devices at any time. For example, my laptop here, I have a camera, and uh, but it's really a terrible camera. So, I, so when I when I want to make a video call, I use an external USB camera, and. Previously, we did not have a stream or any API to discover these devices. And now we've added a, an API called GST device, and something called a GST device monitor, and then something called a GST de global device monitor. So a GST device represents one device, one camera. And then each uh, plugin that can that knows something about devices will pr propose a GST device monitor. And then you can start the device monitor, and then it will tell you when a new device of this class, of this plugin, is connected. And then the GST global device monitor, it, it creates a number of GST device monitors, and allows you to get all the different devices that match your criteria. For example, you can say, I want all, I want to know about cameras on the system, all of them. So if you might have V4L2 cameras. But you might also have diff other kinds of cameras. For example, you might have uh, uh, IEEE 1394 cameras, FireWire cameras, which is DV, which is a completely different input. You might have uh, uh, other things, other kinds of uh, video input. So by having, we can use a single API to uh, enumerate them. And this API, we currently have only limited it for false audio and before L2. But our plan is to implement it on the other platforms so that you can write code that enumerates cameras. That would work on Windows, iOS, Android, etc. And uh, this works for sources and syncs, and audio and video. But our goal is to also be able to enumerate other things. For example, DVD drives or DVDs. So if you want to do DVD playback, we will we'll have something that will give you the list of the DVDs that are currently in the system. And another big thing is that currently all, all the GNOME applications will be copy pasted code from Cheats, the, the webcam app, to enumerate cameras, and that code is specifically for L2. And it's basically been written one and copy pasted everywhere else. So now that we have something in GStreamer, we can avoid this copy pasting. And as I mentioned, we can support different things, and it's extensible. Each uh, device is described by a series of tags, and you can add your own tags to be able to filter the devices. Or you can say, but you can also filter more by the caps. So each uh, each device can declare, I can do H.264, I can do raw video, and I can do JPEG. So, and for example, but the other camera might only do raw video and JPEG with H.264. So you'll be able to say, I only want cameras that can do H.264, or I only want cameras that can do JPEG, because, uh, or I can only do cameras that can do raw video, because some devices might only do H.264 and not raw video. 
So you, you can have different kinds of uh, 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 filters. So the current versions, so version 0 010, it's closed. Don't use it. Seriously. We reject patches. Not interested. Um, version 1.0, it, it, it's basically in a done state. It's not fully closed, but uh, no one's working on it anymore. And we really encourage people to switch to 1.2 because 1.2 is just better. Uh, 1.2, it's a stable version. We maintain it. We make regular releases with only bug fixes. So right now, it's the version that sh you should use if you're doing a product. And, but very soon, we're going to release 1.4, potentially within a month. And that will replace 1.2 as the stable version, in which we will also do bug fixing releases. Uh, as far as maintaining previous stable branches, it really depends on interests. So if people are really are using it, then we will keep on maintaining it. At least, like, at least merging bug fixes and things like that. If uh, people stop using it, we will stop supporting it. This is why 1.0 is basically done, because we don't receive any bug fixes or bug reports for it anymore. I think everyone when moved to 1.0, they're, they're the fast movers, so they've already moved on to 1.2, if not 1.3. And 1.3 is our development version where right? this stuff happens. I also wanted to go over uh, <coughs> some of the open source applications and, you know, that use GDR and what's been going on there. So one of them is PTV. PTV is uh, a video editor. It's an open source video editor. And it's, it's, uh, it doesn't show up on the name, but it, it's written by a French guy originally, and it's P as in Python, and then TV. So it's like Python TV, but it's, it's, it's mostly for, uh, it's really a nonlinear video editor. Uh, it's been ongoing development for a very, very long time, like a decade now, I think. And it's never been very stable. But now there's been a push, very aggressive push, to make it actually usable. And uh, there's going to be a 1.0 version very, very soon now. Uh, the 1.0 version, the big difference from the previous version is that it's just 1. Point something and not 0 0.10. It's GTK3 instead of GTK2. And it's built on something called GST Editing Services, which is an API based on JStreamer that allows you to easily build editing applications. So instead of having to do the low-level things, it does all of the hard work to do a, a video editor. We originally wrote GST editing services to write an editing application on a mobile platform where you, you want a completely different UI from a desktop. But the editing problem is still very much the same. So we wanted to have all the bits common so you can, you can write different UIs or different things on top of that. And we had people not only use it for UIs, but use it for batch processing, like server-side editing of things. Uh, there's also a fundraiser for PTV, where I think they have raised 18,000 euros or dollars. And uh, they, they want to raise enough money to be able to pay someone to work part of this time or full-time and work on that to reach version 1.0. And it's a very nice uh, effort that they've, uh, they've done. They're, they're providing a lot of, of work for the kind of money that they've raised. And the current uh, preview version for, that, for what will become 1.0 is already available in Fair 20. And it is uh, quite good, actually. I, in my flight, I had no internet. I managed to just very quickly make this uh, timeline with uh, showing the different features. So in the previous version, I couldn't get that far to crash. But now it actually works. So we can control, we have a thing to, uh, we have clip, clips here. We can add effects. We have a preview, we have a timeline with different objects in it, different clips. Uh, you see I have selected one bit here, and then in this bit we have, um, uh, a, uh, we can change the volume, we have a graphical thing where you can do various adjustments to the volume, etc. Et so it's, it's very flexible now. 
and we have a lot of, of features that uh, you would expect from a serious video editor, but the UI is still very simple. Our goal is to not, we're not going after like big professional video editors with this project. The goal of PTV is to be something that everyone can use to edit smallish videos or big videos. But we want it to be scalable. No, that you could use it to do serious videos. But right now, that's the, the feature set is limited, but quite surprising. There's a lot of different transitions. We have a lot of effects, etc., etc. Another big one for GNOME is GNOME videos. So Bastien has uh, completely redesigned, redesigned it. He has um, completely changed the UI. I don't know if you used Totem in the past, it was a very uh, past generation video player and it's completely changed it. So now we have something that looks like this, where you can uh, browse through different videos, you can connect to different services, so this is the Apple movie trailers for example, and it's a big, uh, a big, big improvement. And another one that uh, I'm really keen on is something called GNOME Sound Recorder. It's a really, really simple application that has a big record button, and then uh, it draws a little picture when it records, and you be done, and then you have a recording. That's, that's all it does. And uh, it's written in JavaScript, so it's uh, the new uh, appropriate for GNOME 3. It's a very GNOME 3 design. It's very simple. Uh, it was developed by Meg Ford, who was a Summer of Code student last year. Chicago, and she uh, did really, really, really good work. She was involved in other years in the uh, OPW project, the women's uh, open project, women, something like that. And she, uh, so she's done a really, really, really good work there. Um, so these are, uh, I think, the core multimedia applications that have changed in the last release. Hope I didn't forget. Um, also, GStreamer is not only software. For and foremost, it's a community. Uh, we meet twice a year in the GStreamer community. Uh, we meet at the, the GStreamer conference, which is a big conference with speakers, presentations, uh, 50 to 100 people. Uh, we co-host it every year with Embedded Linux Conference Europe or America. Uh, last year, was in Edinburgh, the year before was in the US, in San Diego. Next year it's been announced, it's gonna be in Europe again, in Düsseldorf. So we invite a lot of people to come. And we have a much more small, much smaller event in March of each year, which is a Hackfest, where people meet and code. So uh, this is not like, it's not talks, there's no presentation, there's no schedule, we just come and work and stuff with other people there. Uh, Two years ago was Malaga, last year was Milan, and this year was Munich. Uh, so it's in most in Europe because most of the streamer hackers uh, are in Europe. There's a couple of us in, in America, there's one in Australia, there are some people who contribute from Korea, but uh, most of the core, core hackers are in Europe. So that's, that's why everything happens in Europe. But the community is not only conferences, first and foremost, because that's only twice a year, right? It's only like five days of the year. For the other 360 days, we use the internet. And uh, so the IRC channel is super important. We're, we're there all the time. And we have a mailing list where we answer questions. A lot of questions from users, people who want to try it to write applications, etc. Distributor develop, it's called. And uh, then there is also a Bugzilla. I don't know if you see a previous talk, but we use Bugzilla for contributing patches, reporting bugs. Uh, it, it's don't be afraid to report anything that is broken, because we we want your files to work and your use cases to work, um, and to send us patches. Also, because there are a lot of open bugs, and uh, if it's an easy bug, we'll fix it. If it's a hard bug, we'll keep it open until someone fixes it. 
months now. Uh, so some bugs were good for a very long time and then resulted were fixed after 150 patches. For example, this bug about video for Linux 2, we had a complete re, 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 rethink and refinement of the uh, way memories handled fixes. That's why there was uh, over 100 patches to fix, to fix a very simple crash. But it seems like a simple crash was really led to uh, a lot of work. So uh, this is basically the, the, the important things. Um, yes. So any any questions? Yeah, I have a question uh, because I am uh, uh, working on the simple photography, simple photographer. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, uh, in fact, I really use high TV yeah. as an editor. Uh, but I think uh, mm, it's different from as a demo. Uh, if, if just as a demo of how to edit our own video, high TV is good, it's good enough. Uh, but for a professional editor, uh, I, I, I think it's didn't good well. Yeah. Because uh, one, pro one big problem I think uh, Gstream must uh, overcome is uh, how uh, or, uh, do you have the, any plan to, uh, to solve the uh, use G Gstream to uh, handle the high, defi uh, high uh, definition, or I mean the high re resolution uh, video. For example, uh, uh, 1080 uh, progressive uh, video. This should, uh, this should work fine. HD. Right? Uh, but uh, then I use the uh, totem, uh, totem to view the yeah. uh, HD video. Uh, high definition video. Uh, I don't think it's fluently. Uh, it's always uh, stop, stop, and uh, sometimes perhaps. Uh, well, I guess it depends on your hardware, but they, they, they do work fine on my laptop. But uh, if you have actually, if you have a recent distribution uh, Fedora specifically, uh, yeah. and uh, you install the special Intel packages, if you have an Intel laptop, then you can use the Intel decoder hardware decoder, mm -hmm. and that allows you to uh, play much faster. If you have an NVIDIA card, it's even better. The, the Intel thing takes like 20% CPU to play full HD, mm -hmm. and the NVIDIA one, it's all, all in hardware, and it takes us like 2% CPU to play uh, more than HD, like 4K video on uh, recent hardware. Uh, so, Mian, uh, what about you? Uh, you have a very good uh, hardware system. In multi core infrastructure, yeah, yeah. Uh, for example, the server, uh, the, uh, uh, the station, uh, I, I don't think, uh, for example, the G3 uh, or the IP work well. Uh, because, uh, for example, uh, uh, because of all the video I get uh, is at least 2000 definition. Uh, that yeah. means it's uh, double for the uh, 1080. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but for those kind of uh, source, uh, high TV cannot read them out. Uh, it cannot work. Uh, 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 playing them live is probably a different story, mm -hmm. but you should be able to read them at least. It, it might not be very fast, but, uh, but the, the decoders for most of the formats should be multi threaded. The ones that are uh, the open source libavi one, at least for issue 64, mm -hmm. which is the main important, most important one, but also ProRes, I think we have multi, there's multi threading, and I'm not sure which other formats people use these days, but uh, they, um, and GCR itself is very, very multi threaded, we use a lot of threads, but often the thing is that most of the work is only in one step, mm -hmm. while with GCR, the threads separate the different steps. But often the, the work is like one step, which is the encoding or the decoding, and that will takes all the CPU. So for that to be multi-threaded, the library that does it needs to be multi-threaded. And libv is in most cases, but it really depends on the coding and kind of how, it, how well it's implemented. And, and, uh, another question is, for PyTV, uh, do they have any uh, plan for the editor of multi-track? Because uh, as an editor, uh, it's always the case that I take uh, different shoots mm -hmm. for one scene as different shoots. And uh, uh, when on the editor, uh, editorial platform, uh, I need to decide uh, which kind of shoots I, I will use it. So, uh, for example, for the Final Cut, it uses uh, multi-track 
I can put uh, each shoot on each, every track and then use them. But for ITV, I, I can't find it. Uh, it does multi tracks and uh, send so them. No, it's just only one track. So uh, if, if I if I run 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 run, that's the TV. And I can just add the uh, let me take this one. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Just create a new track like this. But uh, how about the song? Uh, because the audio. Is, oh, yeah, the, the, the audio. Oh, okay. Uh, just separate them, no, no, and then I think it plays. Whoop. Okay. Great. Great. And I think it can reorder tracks and uh, etc. Great. Great. That that should work. So let's, uh, the um, this is the preview version. Uh, this is version uh, 0 0.93. But um, this is from Fedora. I just installed the package. I didn't do anything. It was a young install to give you. But that was the max max number of track uh, for IPv. I don't think there's a fixed <laughs> number. I think it's how, how much RAM do you have in your computer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't know what the resolution of this is. No, this is 480, right? I can, I can have it bigger. Do you have it? Can I have it? <laughs> yes. That's enough. So what I do, I'm going to put boom, 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 boom. Yeah, yeah. All right? Yeah. This, is, this should be 1080p. You can render the first and then see the final. Yeah, rendering will take forever though. Uh, no. No. All right. Broken. <laughs> but, um, there's a, n a number of bugs in the zero yeah. but, uh, something to release. <laughs> if I run the videos, videos. This is the 210 version, it's the older version, as you can see. And then uh, open. Where are you? That should play just fine. And I don't know if it's how works out of it or not. I have no idea. Oh. Yeah, it's probably is, eh? Uh, I guess, uh, no, let the V2%, yeah, I guess the main thing is that it's copying, so that, that, that looks like an Intel driver. So, uh, um, so, but this is using hardware encoding, I would, yes. And we all know it's our favorite video. Alright, I don't know if everyone does the new yeah. With a bit of music. So, yeah. Do you have any, uh, any, any other yeah. questions? Another simple yeah. question. Uh, will GS Streamer uh, support RTMP in the future? There is an RTMP element. Oh, sorry, I didn't see. Yes. Uh, but, but, uh, RTMP, it's not RTMP okay. But you should know that RTMP is not a media streaming protocol, really. Okay. It is a, an RPC, right? Okay. Over RTMP, you just set up arbitrary commands. And uh, each application, RTMP application, speaks a different set of commands. I'm not sure which one is it. There's one is implemented in there, the one from libRTMP. I think it's the one used by some flash application, but different flash applications use different commands. So the server has to speak with this, these commands to be able to do that. Yeah. 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 Anyone else? Uh, this one is uh, three RTMP stream five. But it's uh 
Anyone else? I'm, 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 I guess I'm running out of time anyway, so. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Okay, thank you. And uh, this, about this, uh, this afternoon, we have two more GStreamer talks, so they should be exciting also. In this room, uh, uh, in this afternoon, we'll have another GStreamer talk about uh, GStreamer uh, debugging with uh, just a pet prop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, if you get interested in this, please come back this afternoon. Okay. Let's have lunch. Lunch time. <laughs>